Welcome back everyone. In this video, I'm going to be going over the two most popular stock indexes. That is the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. I'm going to be going over what these indexes are, what stocks they hold, and possibly which one may be better for you to hold as an investor. And if you do appreciate this content, definitely subscribe for future content. And if you do appreciate the video, leave a like for support. So the S&P 500 is widely regarded as the best single gauge of U.S. large cap equities, and this consists of the 500 largest companies in the United States. And personally, I would say that this index even goes further beyond just tracking the largest U.S. equities. I believe that this index is generally considered a gauge for the U.S. economy as a whole. And I believe popular media believes so as well, considering there are many articles about the performance of the S&P 500 based on whoever is the president and how the S&P 500 performed under that president. And the S&P 500 is such a gauge for the economy. Even presidents take jabs at one another about its performance under their administration. So I think it's undoubtable that people definitely believe the S&P 500 is extremely important for the economy and it is also probably the most important gauge for the economy that there is. Even though, of course, there's other factors like inflation, unemployment, income per person. However, the S&P 500 probably bakes all of those factors into the single index. So if you just use the S&P 500 as a gauge, a lot of people believe that if the S&P 500 is doing good, then it's likely that all of the other factors of the economy are probably doing good too, even though there is some disagreement with that. Now, as an investor, you don't buy directly into an index. What you do is you buy an ETF that tracks the index. And the most popular ETF that tracks the S&P 500 is the Spider S&P 500 Trust. Now, the way this ETF operates is very simple. The Spider S&P 500 ETF seeks to provide investment results that generally correspond with the performance of the S&P 500. As this ETF is designed to track the S&P 500, all of its holdings are very large companies, of course, because the index comprises of the 500 largest publicly traded companies in the United States. So you see pretty much all of these companies you all know. This is the top 10 from Microsoft all the way down to Broadcom. I'm pretty sure most of everybody has heard of these companies in the news no matter where you are everybody pretty knows which one of these companies are and this is how the sector breakdown of this etf operates so you can see that about 30 percent of the etf is in information technology stocks while all the way at the bottom 2.14 percent of the etf is in utilities and I think the interesting thing about looking at this, if you consider that the S&P 500 is a matter of tracking the economy as a whole, you see that by far the largest segment of the United States economy is very heavily on the information technology portion in itself. At least that is what the top of 500 represent. And everything else is kind of further behind. In fact, the next largest, which is financials, isn't even half of that top segment. So our economy is very information technology oriented. And if we look back at the top 10, we see, of course, many of these stocks are information technology oriented, whether that be uh, Microsoft or NVIDIA or Meta or Alphabet, which are Facebook and Google. Now, of course, there may be some disagreement whether some of these stocks truly are information technology based, like Apple. Some people say that that kind of operates as a consumer discretionary company, but I think their overall operations basically support that they're information technology. Same thing with Amazon. Of course, they're an online retailer. Some people may say that that is consumer discretionary, but if you look at Amazon Web Services and where they get a lot of their revenue from, I think it becomes pretty clear that they are, in fact, information technology oriented. 
And the S&P 500 index is widely regarded as the best set it and forget it index. So if you're a beginner, it is advocated that you pretty much just buy a fund like the SPY that I just showed or another fund like VOO that tracks the S&P 500. And here is an article basically saying that Warren Buffett, widely regarded as one of the best investors of our time, he advised beginners to consistently invest in low cost index fund despite the market fluctuations and consistently buy a S&P 500 low cost index fund. And historical results probably do speak to this as you can see. So from January 1994 to January of 2024, that is a period of 30 years. And had you have just bought this fund SPY, the Spider S&P 500 Trust, with $10,000 and did not put a single dime in after January of 1994, your $10,000 investment would have became $178,000 roughly. And I would say that that is a great return for just putting that money in, not worrying about it, and then not putting a single dollar in after that. So... This fund itself or this index generally does make people very wealthy over long periods of time, of course, because if you believe in the U.S. economy, then the S&P 500 tracks the largest performing stocks or companies of the U.S. economy that is going to grow over time. Of course, if the U.S. economy is doing bad, like we see during periods of recession, or market bubbles like in the early 2000s, you will of course see that go down because the US economy is not doing so well. But if you believe in the US economy long term, and if you actually look at international markets and how poorly they perform, you see that the S&P 500 and the US economy is generally the best performer of them. So again, if you believe in the performance of the U.S. economy, then this is a no-brainer investment over time because the U.S. economy is going to do better over time and your investment will do better over time as well. Now we move on to the NASDAQ and a bit about the NASDAQ itself. The NASDAQ is actually a stock exchange in itself. So the NASDAQ isn't actually an index, it is a stock exchange. Now what most people say when they talk about investing in the NASDAQ is the NASDAQ composite. And now the NASDAQ composite is a stock index. So it includes all stocks pretty much listed on the NASDAQ stock exchange. Now, just like the S&P 500, you can't directly invest into the index itself, so you have to buy an ETF that tracks it. And interestingly, I could not find an ETF that tracks the entire NASDAQ itself. What I did come across is this ETF, which is the Fidelity Composite Index of the NASDAQ. It does include a, a large number of the holdings of NASDAQ and this ETF isn't even really that popular, to be honest with you. I think its total assets under management is like under 10 billion, which is very small considering an ETF that tracks the NASDAQ. And now what most people do when they buy the NASDAQ is they don't even track the entire NASDAQ and neither do I. I own this ETF and this ETF is QQQ, which is the Invesco QQQ Trust. And QQQ is also very simple in its methodology. It simply tracks the NASDAQ 100 index, and that pretty much gives you the performance of the 100 largest non-financial companies listed on the NASDAQ. So this doesn't invest in the entire NASDAQ. And again, I couldn't find an ETF that does. This just invests in the top 100 largest companies listed on the NASDAQ itself. And you're going to see a lot of crossover with these holdings here. So if you remember, these holdings are very similar to some of the holdings of the S&P 500. And you do see, of course, Microsoft, Apple, NVIDIA, Amazon. In fact, most of these companies, if not uh, like all of them, are also listed on the S&P 500 because the S&P 500 is designed to track the 500 largest companies 
And it also happens that these companies that are on the NASDAQ index or exchange are some of the largest companies in the United States. So remember, the S&P 500 tracks the 500 largest companies regardless of the exchange that they are listed on. So it doesn't matter as long as they're included in the top 500 largest companies, the S&P 500 will track them. And if we do a comparison with the ETFs SPY, remember, which is the S&P 500 ETF and the QQQ, which is the NASDAQ 100 ETF, you'll find that 84% of QQQ's holdings are also in SPY. So when you invest in SPY, you're pretty much getting the largest portion of QQQ also because there's so much overlap because QQQ has companies that are also the largest in the United States. And when you invest in the S&P 500, you are pretty much only getting a 16.7% overlap with QQQ. So S&P 500, of course, is quite a bit more diverse and we are going to get into the holdings. So this is pretty much all of its holdings. We went over that there. But I want to give you an industry breakdown, which I believe is more important. Now, the NASDAQ and the NASDAQ 100 in particular is a, a lot more technology heavy than the S&P 500. If you remember, the S&P 500, I believe, had about 28% of its holdings in technology. The NASDAQ has about 58% of its holdings in technology. And you also see the other holdings are quite a bit less. And if we do a little bit of simple math, you see that consumer discretionary, it's a second largest holding, is only about 19%, which is not even or a little bit under three times or so, around three times less than the technology portion. So you see that technology is a huge component of the NASDAQ index and even more so the NASDAQ 100. So you're really not getting that diversity that the S&P 500 offers. Now, moving on to past performance, this doesn't go quite as far as the S&P 500 ETF SPY because the ETF QQQ hasn't really been around for as long as SPY, but I think 24 years will give a good idea here. Now, if we look at the prior performance, we do see that QQQ has outperformed by a, a little bit. And a big portion of that is because recently, of course, in the past 20 years in particular, a large part of growth has been in technology. And because QQQ invests in a lot more technology, we do see that that performance is going to be influenced by it. Now, I want you to not only think about performance here, but I also want to kind of highlight the importance of looking at these two in the entirety. So this is, of course, with $10,000. And if you look at this historically, the NASDAQ, particularly QQQ, had you have invested that $10,000 at the beginning, you would have actually have performed very, very badly uh, over time. And if we like, look, you didn't actually switch with the performance of the S&P 500 until midway through a 2020. So you would have been down on your initial $10,000 investment for a long time. Now, of course, I also want you to consider that this ETF pretty much started during the tech bubble burst of the late 1990s and early 2000s. And I also want you to consider that most investors would be dollar cost averaging along the way. But you pretty much see that even though NASDAQ did perform better, it didn't perform better for a very long time. And I also want you to focus on these max drawdowns and also these standard deviations. So standard deviation could be looked at as a measure of volatility. So the higher the standard deviation, the more these ETFs will swing up and down. 
So the standard deviation of QQQ is quite a bit higher than the S&P 500. And of course, so is the max drawdown. So if you're an investor and you don't like those huge swings, the NASDAQ or QQQ may not be the best thing for you. So the question everybody wants answered is probably which one of these indexes are better? Should I buy the S&P 500 or should I buy the NASDAQ? Now, in my opinion, the S&P 500 was largely used as a gauge of the U.S. economy as a whole. So I think if you are to buy the S&P 500, you are going to get quite a bit more diversity in regards to industry. You're going to get more holdings as an entirety, and you're just going to get a more broad section of the U.S. economy as a whole. Now, if you're looking for growth and you think tech will perform well and you're not really worried about volatility, then I don't think the QQQ, the fund that tracks the 100 largest performers in the NASDAQ, would be that bad of an idea. Now, keep in mind, of course, that the tech assets that it holds may or may not do well in the future. So if you do believe tech will continue to do well, then you can go to the QQQ and know that you are still going to be buying some great companies, but you just aren't going to get as much diversity and you're not going to get that big of a cross-section into the United States economy. So I do hope that you enjoyed this video. I do hope that it did provide a breakdown. If you did enjoy this content, again, leave a like and subscribe for future content, and I will see you all in the next video. Thanks for watching.